Hello and welcome to episode 161 of section 138. I'm your host, Mark Colley, as always, joined by Bryson and Jacob. And guys, now that we're not recording every couple of days, it feels weird. It feels like it's been a long time since we've last talked. It feels like it has been forever and I'm glad to be here. You know, we've, uh, the playoffs are continuing to go uh, as I guess not planned, but they just keep going. We're in the ALCS now in the NLCS and uh, we have our final, what, four teams here before we are one more round away from the world series. So regardless of who you had in your bracket or not, I'm not sure if you guys had your bracket broken just yet, but I do know I was the lone wolf last night on my LA Dodgers, not my LA, I'm kidding, but the LA Dodgers, beating the San Francisco Giants. And of course, the Houston Astros is somebody else who I had um, going on to the ALCS. But anyways, other than that, I am good. And just to say it one more time, I miss the Blue Jays a lot. I think I was completely wrong in my bracket. Like, I didn't get a single thing right. I said the Yankees would win the AL wild card. I said the Cardinals would win the NL wild card. I said the Giants would win the NLDS. That was wrong. I said the Rays would win, win the ALDS. That was wrong. I've been completely wrong. I've been 0 for 4, 0 for 6, however many series there's been so far. So we'll see how it goes. But Jacob, how are you? First of all, I'm not even mentioning my bracket because I think you guys know who I predicted to win. And well, they lost on a, uh, what was it? A, a sack fly, but whatever. I will let that transpire the way it did. But yeah, it feels weird not recording every few days. Like we've basically been doing that for four, five, six months or however long we had done it for. And it feels weird. I'll be completely honest, but I'm still happy to do it. You know, once a week is still better than than nothing. I mean, it's it's definitely still a fun thing to talk about. And especially, especially after watching the Leafs lose to one of the uh, expected to be one of the worst teams in the league. It's fun to talk about a team that's supposed to be good. So I'll leave it at that. Toronto sports is, is, a, is a weird place, but it's, we can make it fun. Hey, in defense of the senators, they're getting better. They're improving. They are on the rise. They I, are. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to bring up the one hockey stat. I know they were the only <laughs> team last year to not get shut out. So I didn't even know that. Well, that's good yeah, on you. I'm, I'm surprising. <laughs> wow. Anyways, this is, <laughs> this is a baseball podcast. We're not here to talk about hockey. Um, we're here to count down the top 10 moments of 2021. So as a part of our, uh, you know, off season before the off season actually starts schedule, we had our episode last week, looking back at our predictions from the start of 2021. Today, we're counting down the top 10 moments of the 2021 season for the Blue Jays. Next week, we're going to be counting down the top 10 worst moments of the 2021 season. Then we're going to be wrapping up our schedule with a preview of the off season in there as well as some of our predictions for the off season. So that's kind of what the schedule looks like for this off season and for the postseason before we actually get to the official off season starting, but let's kick off our top 10 moments of 2021. Number 10. And it is Jose Barrios's debut as a blue Jay, of course, coming at the end of July, the blue Jays trade two top of the line prospects for him. So there's a lot riding on the start when he makes it. Um, it was kind of expected heading into it to be this David Price-esque start, this David Price-esque guy who's leading the Blue Jays to the postseason. And, of course, we know it doesn't quite work out that way, so this start might not hold the same lore in Blue Jays history as that David Price start does. But still, um, Brios does very well. He kind of gets into a few jams in the early goings and the sixth inning, but he works out of it. Six innings pitched, five hits, zero earned runs, one walk, seven strikeouts. And at that moment, you know, we're all thinking of it as a David Price start. Doesn't end up working out that way. But at that moment in the season, it was a, a pretty important start and a pretty cool moment for the Blue Jays. Absolutely. And when you think about it, he started on August the 1st. And so the day before that, the Blue Jays had just came home. They had just won. And I know we'll get into that, but it was kind of a Christmas season type thing for the Blue Jays where just everything seemed to be going right. Jose Barrios, I'll be completely honest. There was a lot of pressure on him considering you give up guys that pretty much everybody expected to be on your roster next, next season, or at least within the next few. And he did get into some trouble throughout the, his second and third start or third and fourth, whatever it was like the uh, early August days. But basically the point is, is the blue Jays and their fans really expected a lot out of him. 
and he delivered, you know, the Royals say what you want about how they're not necessarily a great team, but when you look at it, the Blue Jays had just come home. They made moves like let, let's be, let, let's not forget that they, they needed to acquire players and they acquired players. They, they looked like they were going to honestly go on a run. And to be completely honest, they sort of did. And had the format have been different, had maybe one game have gone the other way earlier on in the season, they could have made the playoffs, but this was the turning point for the team. And it started really, it started with this acquisition and this start. And you look at, you know, Barrios, he was fantastic this season. And I think the, the important thing is he's not only a blue Jay for 2021 is they have him next season. And I'm not going to get into, can the blue Jays afford him and Ray and whatever, but this is a guy that you would now have for many years. And considering he was able to come in, have his first start really dominate, it just it it really proved that this was the best thing that the Blue Jays could have done in the offseason and honestly or in the at the trade deadline. And it really was the turning point for this team because they had won nine of their or, or 10 of their 11, however many games that was in the homestand. And it was probably one of the greatest starts I think we've seen in recent memory, just considering all eyes were on Brios and had the restrictions at the Rogers Center not really have existed or, or not have been what they were we probably could have seen a, a packed house for that, for that debut. Yeah. I mean, going back to, I think it was, it was early, it was mid May to it was mid to late May and then early June, maybe as well as when this, the rumors for him started to pick up regardless if it was the Jays or anybody, it was known well known around the baseball world that Jose Barrios was the name that could potentially have been dealt uh, this summer. Cause obviously the twins came into 2021 expecting a lot of better, um, pretty much a lot of better things from what happened with them this year. It was very disappointing for them, probably one of the most disappointing teams of the year. And because of the start they had, because of the struggles they had right off the bat, uh, they decided to part ways with Jose Barrios and kind of, I guess, retool, but kind of rebuild at the same time. And uh, that's exactly what they did. And the Jays were among many teams who were looking for Jose Barrios or interested in him. And it was something that they really needed to do to help bolster this uh, starting rotation. So, I mean, at the time you had Alec Manoa, obviously, who already came up and made his MLB debut. Uh, you had Robbie Ray, who was pretty much carrying the rotation from there. Hunjin Ryu began to kind of have his downfall around that time as well. So this was one of the missing pieces that the Jays needed. Uh, for their starting rotation. It was kind of one more move away from them taking that next step from them being a, a legitimate contender from, you know, turning the starting rotation from the weakness to a strong point. And that's exactly what happened once they did pull the trigger um, on the trade, regardless if you think it was too much or not for what the Jays gave up, they get Jose Brios and Jacob, like you mentioned, they get him not for this year only, they get him for next year as well. So it's something that helps them uh, pitch for 20 or, you know, just helps them put something together for 2022 and, um, you know, another interesting thing is going to be, you know, in one year from now to see where we are with him as well in terms of his contract. But I think an extension is something that the Jays are obviously going to try and do. But this was a key moment uh, for this year, pretty much for this team. And once they got him, the starting rotation definitely, uh, it was already kind of turning on the right note at the time, but it definitely was completely in the, the steered in the right direction once they got him. And he really didn't disappoint. I know he had a couple of shaky starts off the bat, but overall, near the end of it and pretty much after those few shaky starts, he really got his game together and he really showed why this is, uh, or why the Jays did what they did and traded for him and gave up what they gave up to get Jose Brios in a blue Jays uniform. And he was a, a pleasure to watch and pretty much one of the best, if not one. Yeah. So pretty much one of the best uh, pitchers in this rotation. And for 2022, you have to imagine that he's going to have a similar role again, where he's pretty much near the top of the depth chart. One, two, three starter. It's, it's going to depend on what happens as well with somebody like Robbie Ray and pretty much other moves that could happen uh, throughout the off season. So for Jose Barrios, definitely a key highlight on this for me is uh, for all of us. And, you know, it just it don't disagree with it at all. Completely agree with him being a blue Jay is one of the top moments of the year. And like I mentioned right off the top, it is what they needed to kind of head in the right direction with the starting rotation. And that's exactly what happened. And when I was talking with, when this deal happened with some of my Red Sox friends and everyone was kind of wondering, you know, why on earth did the Blue Jays make this deal? They overpaid for him. It's way too much. And of course, living in um, Red Sox territory in New Hampshire, it's close to the New Hampshire Fisher Cats. So everyone knew kind of familiar with who Austin Martin is, who Simeon Woods Richardson is. They're wondering, you know, why are the Jays giving up these two top 100 prospects for a guy that, you know, 
looking at this team, they're a team that's slightly above 500. They have a big potential, but like, what is this guy doing for this team? And I, I think the big thing was that he's under contract, not just for this year, but for next year as well. If it was only for, you know, two months, three months, if it was a rental type deal, of course, this would be a mistake to give up those two top prospects for a couple months of service time. But because you get them for next year, because you solidify the rotation for next year, it's an important part of the Blue Jays season and an important trade to make, even though you're giving up those top prospects. Um, when we look at kind of these moments of the Blue Jays season, we aren't just looking at like most entertaining moments, but we're, I, I think part of our criteria is how it's going to be remembered in years to come. And this moment, I feel like you can't tell the story of the Blue Jays season in 2021 without this moment, without the start from Jose Brios, because it maps out the trajectory of the 2021 Blue Jays. As much as we look at their return home as a turning point, maybe this Jose Brios start was part of that turning point. And like you said, Jacob, they win 9 of 11 or 10 of 11 after coming home. They go on the road, a little bit rough sailing, and we know what happens then, but then they come back, they win eight in a row later at the start of September, and we all know the story there. But let's move on to number nine. Number nine on our list is the Orioles doubleheader, where the Blue Jays won 11 to 10 and 11 to 2. Um, quite a game for the Blue Jays, quite a pair of games for the Blue Jays on this doubleheader. They're coming off an eight game win streak, which pretty much put them back in the hunt. You know, we mentioned that losing streak that they went on and we all declared them dead after that Detroit Tigers series. Um, this eight game win streak put them back in the hunt and then they lose the first game of their series and they lose the winning streak in that first game of the series against the Orioles. And it's kind of an oh crap moment, right? It's like, what's going on? You just swept the Yankees, swept the Athletics, both teams that are very much in the wildcard hunt, and then you lose to one of the worst teams in baseball for the past few years. It's like, what is going on? Um, and then game one of that doubleheader, we kind of get more of that. The Jays are losing another game to the Orioles. They're down 10-5 in the fifth. It's only a seventh inning, seven inning game, remember? Um, they're down 10-7 in the seventh. Um, and then you get a double, walk, RBI single, and sack fly. Jay's still down a run. It's 10 to nine. And then Jansen flies out to get the Jays um, to their final out. So it's 10, nine with one out left for the blue Jays. And then George Springer to the rescue. He hits a two run bomb. He makes it 11 to 10 and the Jays win that one. And then game two, we kind of get the same thing. It's another Oh crap moment. It's like, you're being no hit by the Orioles into the seventh inning by, uh, I think it was Keegan Aiken who was on the mound for that game. Um, it's an oh crap moment for the Blue Jays, right? It's if you want to be competing and you're being no hit by Keegan Aiken in the seventh inning by the Baltimore Orioles, what is going on? Um, but it's only a one zero game at that point. Vladdy singles, Bo Bichette hits a home run to give the Jays the lead. And you're thinking, you know, great. <laughs> the Jays won this game. Perfect. They just have to get three outs. Um, and that's not the case for the Blue Jays because they go on to score 11 runs in that inning. They send 16 batters to the plate. They get six straight hits. They go single homer, single homer, single, single to start that inning. Um, and I think this moment after that eight game win streak, after everything we saw the Blue Jays go through, I think this was a moment where we thought this team, team can do it. Yes, it's against the Orioles, but having this type of performance is just absolutely incredible. Um, it continues for the rest of the series, kind of goes down the drain afterwards, and we know what happens with the Blue Jays season, but um, a very special moment. And again, when we're telling the story of this season, I think this, this doubleheader is going to be remembered for a while. It's just a cool moment for the Blue Jays and an awesome pair of games to happen on one day. Mm -hmm. And say what you want about the Orioles being a bad team. At the end of the day, this was a game or these, these were two games that the Blue Jays made up in the standings. And one of the, the things we talk about, they had such a difficult schedule at the start of the season. It did get a bit easier, but over the course of a full season, it's going to be about average. But at the end of the day, the Blue Jays needed to make ground in the standings, and they did. And, you you know, you look at, obviously, Springer didn't really have the season that he expected to or that he wanted to. He missed more than half of it with injury. But what he's able to do, he comes up with two outs. You're expecting, I mean, uh, nobody's really expecting a home run. I mean, you're expecting probably in all honesty you have a better chance of getting out than you do scoring runs but he comes up he gives the Blue Jays the lead and I just I remember I had just gotten home and I was like okay I'm gonna watch that last inning hopefully maybe something happens and well something did happen and I screamed quite loud you, you know I think one of the the things that September taught me is I need to chill out and not scream 
after every run that the Blue Jays score. But you know what? It was fun. And and the Blue Jays, like, it, the thing that was cool is, yeah, the Blue Jays scored those runs. They won. But there was another chance to win. Like, they, they literally had that second game after them. And that carries over into that second game of the doubleheader where I just remember saying, how are you getting shut out? Not only shut out, but how are you getting no hit? by a guy whose ERA is, I think, in the sevens. And if I'm not mistaken, I, I went to one of those games in Toronto, Blue Jays and Orioles. I think it was the Ryu versus Aiken game, or it was the Ryu started, but I think it was Aiken as well. And I remember saying, oh, yeah, they got a, a, a guy with a seven ERA on the mound. Maybe they'll score some runs. And they ended up losing, I think, five to two. And then in this game, I'm like, how are you, how are you, how do you not even have a single hit? And I think they had one base runner in, I think it was like a walk in the first inning. And then, it looked they scored like multiple touchdowns in that second inning or almost two touchdowns. And it was absolutely ridiculous. And I just, I don't even, sometimes you, you look at these moments, you're like, well, how do you even describe it? Like they scored 11 runs, seven straight hits. And it's just, it was amazing. Blue Jays. I think they proved that they weren't dead yet. I guess that's the way you can look at it is yeah. They didn't make the playoffs. They didn't, you know, they, they didn't, they weren't able to make as much ground as they needed to, but they proved that they were not going down without a fight. And it started with these game games where you're down, you're losing, but you, you want to put up an 11 spot. I think they did something similar against the Red Sox in that first uh, series in Toronto where they were down, I think two to one or, or three to one or whatever. And then they scored six or seven runs. Like the, the team proved that they are not done. And yeah, the season didn't play with the way you wanted, but the, if you have a roster like the Blue Jays had in September throughout an entire season, ooh, I would look out if I was at pretty much anybody else in baseball because we might, like we talk about our top 10 moments now, most of them are from the second half and more importantly, the second or the last third of the season. Like if you have that team over a full season, we easily could be seeing a another parade in Toronto next year. Like it, the, when you look at what this team has, and the capabilities and the things that they've proven in, in September. Like it, it starts with these games that look like they're going to go the other way or like, ah, whatever, we'll throw this one out. We'll move on. We'll go into next game, but no, the Blue Jays hang on by whatever thread they can. And it just, it proved that they're, they're in this race, no matter, I think what, what the score says or what the standings say, because they went into September and everyone called them a write-off and, they needed to win 20 games. If I'm not mistaken, they won around that. I don't have the math exactly, but games like these are the ones you have to win. You have to come back from, and it, it, it really did give them a shot to make the playoffs. Yeah. I mean, it was just a crazy game, uh, especially that doubleheader. And it was kind of a bizarre series because prior to the doubleheader, that was also the weird exchange between Robbie Ray and Brandon Hyde. That was obviously earlier in the series. I think it was the Friday night game. And I just remember like we, we, it was just kind of weird of what the heck was going on. And then it was just all, all around the weekend was crazy. And obviously that double header is not only a memorable moment for, you know, the, the Jays just to say, Oh, look, we did this. We did that in one day. They needed those two wins for their playoff implications and for them pretty much in the wild card race. So that's what makes it even more important for me. And it's just crazy uh, the way baseball works. You guys were mentioning uh, from game two, but I guess I'll start from game one, you know, Hunjin Ryu, somebody who's been struggling or struggled for majority of the year. Uh, he has a bad start and right then and there Ross stripling comes in, he gives up a couple runs as well. And you figure, you figure the game was over by then. And then all of a sudden the Jays began to rally back. We all know Lourdes Gurriel Jr.'s hot September was one of the reasons why they came back to that as well. A couple sack flies and George Springer was the one who hit the go ahead home run. And uh, for someone like Springer, who that was when he was starting to maybe just a little bit get, uh, he started to get going. He was obviously dealing with the bad knee. And at that time he was still DHing every day. So that was kind of a, a good sign to see as well. And then game two was definitely the most bizarre one for me because you guys were mentioning it. Keegan Aiken has a no hitter going into the seventh inning. And, you know, for some reason, Keegan Aiken had the Jays number this year. And that's why it made it so frustrating, especially when you look at his ERA and his numbers and you kind of wonder like, what's he doing differently than anybody else was and why all of a sudden are the Jays just struggling to hit off of this guy. And then all of a sudden they put up the amount of runs they did in the seventh inning it was absolutely insane of what the heck happened that day. And um, we all know what happened pretty much. And it's just a crazy weekend because the next day as well, I think they came up and put out 22 runs. So overall, the entire series was an offensive explosion, but the doubleheader was definitely the memorable moment or kind of, yeah, just the highlight of the weekend as well, because of 
the amount of, you know, just the amount of runs they put up late in the game. And of course that second game being no hit going into your final three outs of the game, completely bizarre and completely something that we've never seen before. And it might not be something we see again, because I believe uh, the seven inning doubleheaders will not be returning uh, as of next year and going forward. So who knows when we see something like that crazy again, especially in the seven inning game. And that's what was crazy about the seven inning games is that it was so unpredictable and so short. And we all know how, you know, especially with the Jays who are kind of trailing both of those games, you know, time was really running out of their side because of, uh, you know, the seven inning game and they made up for it in the final inning by scoring the amount of, you know, runs that they did. And uh, a couple highlights from them as well. And it was just a well-needed couple wins uh, for them to stay alive in the wild card race. And like I said, they came out the next day as well and put up another good, I think it was 22 runs. So it was just overall a crazy weekend of offense at Camden Yards. And it was definitely a good way to end it after, um, you know, going back to like I mentioned at the beginning with Brandon Hyde on the Friday night game. So that was something that was definitely really cool to witness and, um, you know, kind of glad it happened to him after what the heck he was screaming at Robbie Ray for us. We still don't really know what was going on that day, but definitely a a really strong weekend for the Jays and definitely uh, a moment to remember throughout the year for sure. Well, Bryson, you're alluding to the 22 game run game right after, and that comes right next in our list at number eight. Um, It was a pretty amazing weekend for the blue Jays. You mentioned it. 11 runs in the first game, 11 runs in the second game, then 22 runs on the Sunday game. Um, I kind of feel guilty making this the next pick, you know, using two picks in this list on one series against the Orioles that ultimately, you know, it's against the Orioles, but still, this was an incredible moment of the Blue Jays season scoring 22 runs. It was 17 to three by the third inning. Like what? (laughs) You know, scoring 17 runs in three innings alone is crazy. And then the Jays score and, and tack on a few more. Um, just a few records from this game. The 22 to 7 win is the second most runs scored in franchise history. And the 27 runs that the Blue Jays scored over a four inning span, dating back to um, the, the, the second game, the seventh inning of the second game of the doubleheader on that Saturday, going into the first three innings of that Sunday game against Baltimore. That's the most over four inning span in MLB history. Um, there, I think it was 44 or 47 runs also set uh, a club record for the most runs in a four game series. Um, and the Jays after this game, they also moved into a two way tie for the AL wildcard race with the Red Sox. So lots of moving parts here, but just to say this offensive performance, one for the history books, one that we can always be impressed by. And it also had ramifications in the standings for the Blue Jays. Yeah, that game, it it was weird because I remember I was watching it at work and I'm probably like one of two people that actually watch baseball there. And everybody kind of knows me as the guy that will probably have the game on in the background and everyone allows it, but like, whatever. So nobody really knew what was going on. They're like, oh, 17 runs. And there are a few football fans. They're like, oh, okay, that's, you know, I don't know, a couple runs or whatever. And I was like, no, that like, that's a lot of runs. Like, this is ridiculous what we're seeing. And I think there were, there was a Gurriel and a Hernandez uh, grand slam. I think there was, were in the first two innings or something or whatever. It was like the first inning and the third inning. And that game was ridiculous. And you look at how the Blue Jays, their run differential was so high. One of the only run differentials that was actually positive in the wild card race. It's because of times like this, where you're able to just tack on runs at, at literally a football pace. Like it's it just, when you think about how many runs they scored, I think if I'm not mistaken, that was like the first time since 2017, maybe when, or since they've scored that many runs when it was like 22 to something against the Ori or the, the Royals or whatever. But it was this again, like it was just this entire series really was a turning point for this team. And I, we say turning point because it just seems as if there were so many of them, like the trade deadline, the Brio start, really the entire last two months of the season was just a roller coaster of, of highs and and even the lows weren't even that bad except for a few that were not very good but you know you look at a series like this and, and really a game like this this was it was a, just another statement like hey we're not done yeah we might be out it might be it might be difficult to come back but you score this many runs and, and how does any team not look at this and, and get a little scared it, honestly you know I do and, and you feel bad for I think a lot of the pitchers in these games because it's just it's just an era inflator type situation where there's really nothing you can do about it and 
whoever gets thrown in is probably going to have a few earn runs charged to them in in maybe an inning of work. But if you're the Blue Jays, this is a game you had to win. I mean, we can say that pretty much for most of the games throughout that last portion of the season, but they had to win. They needed to take this series. They needed to really win almost every single game and and they did it. Well, they, they did most of them, but it just, it, when you look at what they needed to do, this is what they needed to do. They needed to win and they needed to scare guys. Like when you, if you're the Yankees, if you're anybody like Garrett Cole, how are you not scared of a team that's able to just put up this many runs somewhat easily? Like you have Guriel who had four grand slams. I think this season you have Hernandez with the grand grand slam Guerrero had a, a grand slam. These are some of your best guys and they honestly, they can hit pretty much anybody out of the ballpark. And that's what I think is, is the most entertaining of this team. And you talk about how baseball needs to get more entertaining and have more things for the younger fans to really enjoy. This is one of those things that I think a lot of people can enjoy is well, runs being scored at this pace. Like, how do you not watch that and not get entertained? Like what's that? Are you not entertained meme or, or saying, I don't know, but that type of situation. Like, how are you not entertained when you're seeing this many runs? It just, it was fantastic. You love to see things like that. All you could have hoped is that could have happened in the wild card game because it would have been would have been a great moment to see this team be able to put up those types of numbers. But either way, great to see. And you hope that down the stretch in 2022, we can see even more of those, even especially into the playoffs. This offense, when clicking and when everyone was on point and we didn't really got a lot of that because a lot of people were up and down the pitching was bad it just it, it took them a while to get going and finally to mesh together but once they did that it was so fun to watch and it was obviously one of the best offenses that we've ever witnessed here in this franchise and um you know just seeing that and seeing what they did this weekend in particular we we, we just spoke about the double header and now you're talking about the next day when they put up 22 runs like it doesn't matter if it's the Orioles or not. Like that is impressive. Like, I'm sorry. I don't take anything away from who they played or let that take anything, you know, kind of put a star beside or anything like that of, of an asterisk. This was something that was just memorable to watch and it was keeping their season alive after pretty much them being out of it for most of the year and kind of falling out of it near um, earlier on in the month. So that's why for me, it's a crucial moment of the season and just watching everyone clicking at the same time, you know, the amount of fun they have with the home run jackets and everything like that. Everybody, especially that game alone, was hitting home runs. Like everybody, no matter who was in that lineup, was getting on base and, you know, produced in some sort of way. So that's why um, it's definitely a memorable moment for me as well. And, um, you know, just seeing, you know, the potential they had. And it still pains me to say it. And I'm sure it pains everyone to say it too, just to see or just to know that we never got a chance to see these guys. Um, you know, have a moment like this or have an opportunity in the playoffs definitely bothers me a bit, but either way, definitely a good moment for sure for 22 runs. And um, it was one of many more moments from this year for sure. Definitely one that we'll remember for a while and kind of goes hand in hand with that 18 to four win against the Red Sox um, earlier in the season in June. That was also a special moment for the Blue Jays just scoring a lot of runs. And I think they had seven home runs that day or something like that. Just wild stats left and right. For this offense that, like you mentioned, Jacob, it was up and down oftentimes, and that's why there are so many turning points of this season because the Blue Jays were up and riding high, and then they kind of collapsed for a few weeks, and they come back and do amazing. So that's why a lot of these moments feel like turning points, but we're going to move to the next moment. We're done with playoff talk, and we're moving to moment number seven. So this one is Alec Manoa's debut. We're going all the way back to May 27th at Yankee Stadium. Um, no one expected him to be up this early. We've talked about it. We all expected him to spend a lot more time in the minor leagues, the lower minor leagues first, not bumped up directly to AAA. And then um, expectation after expectation is just shattered when Manoa comes up. And um, he has probably one of the best seasons in franchise history for a rookie. Um, and it started on this day at Yankee Stadium. He shoves. He goes six innings pitch, two hits, zero earned runs, two walks, seven strikeouts. And it matters extra so because it's only a 2-0 win for the Blue Jays. Um, it's not like they blew out the Yankees in that game. They skated by by barely any offense. And Alec Manoa's start was pivotal for that. Um, very cool moment for his family as well, who's obviously in attendance there. And 
um, from what we heard, it was very loud and they were a very big part of the atmosphere there. So obviously this isn't one of Alec Manoa's best starts of the season. We know he had incredible starts, you know, against the Rays later on in the season where he carried a no hitter until later in the game. And I think he had an eight innings pitched one hit start at one point. But um, I think when we're talking about special moments that we'll remember from this season, this Alec Manoa debut game is definitely one. If he's going to be a starter for the Blue Jays for the next, you know, four or five years, it's going to be a moment we're going to remember for sure. Yeah, look at the the job Alec Manoa was able to do. And I don't really think anybody expected this. I mean, I think it, two of us said that there was a 0% chance that he comes up this season. And if he even did come up, it would be, be because in September, the Blue Jays were out of it. Well, in May, they were somewhat in it. He came up and was one of the reasons they stayed in it. And to be completely honest, he's my game two starter in any playoff series. If you have Robbie Ray and you have Brio starting that wild card game, I'll be honest. I think maybe even game one, depending on who's in the rotation next season, it, it a lot of things have to fall into place. But he has playoff picture or playoff pitcher written all over him. And you, you look at what the Blue Jays needed. They had, I think, two guys in the rotation at one point legitimate guys like the rest were either injured or guys that were just filling in for guys that were injured and Alec Manoa comes up he is you look at Barrios him and Barrios I think were the two that really transitioned this rotation from being a passable at best to honestly one of the better rotations in the American League and even the MLB like that he really like you you I think it's tough to say what how good he was because I think a lot of us didn't really have much expectations but at the same time he came up was one of their best starters and when you think about it the Blue Jays have him and Pearson probably slated in the rotation and in the rotation for the next four to five seasons so we like, like I said if, if you're in a playoff series this could easily be your two three games two or three starters like th these two are both uh, not really Pearson because he didn't have as much of a season just because of injuries. But when you're looking at Alec Manoa, he was amazing. And all you can say is that how do you, maybe if he came up a little earlier, Blue Jays win a couple more games, but I'm not going to get into that topic. That's a whole other thing. But Alec Manoa comes up is one of the best pitchers and 2022 is he's, I think he's a lock honestly for that two spot or two or three. So it, it'll be good to see. And it was just, it was amazing to see him blow a fastball by some of the, the best home run hitters in the league in Aaron judge. It absolutely was. And for Alec Manoa, we knew the segment we had the Alec Manoa watch as much as it didn't last long. It was something that was, I don't know. I, I had enjoyed doing it every week with all of us speculating and changing our timelines and everything like that. And we all know how it was just so unpredictable for him to come up here two years after being drafted. And um, you know, none of us would have, ever thought that this was legitimately possible in spring training so for Alec Manoa to come up like that like the way he did at Yankee Stadium to debut like that and yeah maybe turning himself into probably one of the top three starters in this rotation I mean he's definitely one of them and uh, yeah we mentioned it last week as well when we recorded about him being playoff material and having that caliber in him and that's why uh, you look forward to what the future holds for him and you know that he's gonna have another solid uh, role on this team next year so for Alec Manoa Definitely a great moment. And that was the beginning. Uh, if you want to talk about the Brios thing earlier on, which was another, I think it was the 10th moment. This was when it started to steer in the right direction when Alec Manoa came up. And at the time, it looked like a desperation move. They looked like the Jays were pretty much out of options. And, you know, they kind of were. And they were really re relying on him and a rookie like that to do that and pitch that well. And they were really taking the chance that he would have done that. And it, it turned out to work for him. And that's why it began to steer it around. And then, of course, the Brios thing, completely fixed or kind of solved it and put everything in that right direction. But Alec Manoa was definitely the starting point to the turnaround of this rotation. And he was filthy. He's a stud. And you look forward to what he can do next year as well. In a full season with Alec Manoa in your rotation, the Jays appear to be in good hands. And hopefully he's also in that playoff rotation as well next year. So we'll see what happens with that. But Alec Manoa, definitely one of the bright spots and definitely one of the key moments from this year for sure was him becoming officially becoming a member of the Jays in the big league roster. And looking back at the rotation in the early parts of the season, I do want to, you know, allude to and give credit to Ross Stripling. I know this is a moment about Alec Manoa, but this is part of our, uh, you know, season recap and postmortem on the season. Ross Stripling was very good for the Blue Jays for an extended period of time in the rotation. And I don't think we can forget that the Blue Jays wouldn't be where they were 
without Ross Stripling, of course, there are other players on this team that are more important, like Alec Manoa, as we've talked about, Robbie Ray, other starters that made more of an impact than Ross Stripling. But for a period of time there in June and July, he really solidified the Blue Jays rotation and gave them depth and solid starts where they needed it. So I just wanted to get that in there. I'm a Ross Stripling fan, so wanted to give him credit for that. But yes, Alec Manoa, his debut is uh, an amazing moment from this season. All right, on to moment number six. Vladimir Guerrero Jr.'s three homer game. This came on April 27th. So we're going all the way back to the first month of the season. We remember kind of the offensive struggles at the beginning of things into a few weeks of the season. And then the Blue Jays have that 15 to one game, I think, against the Angels. And um, it kind of, you know, got them off the ground in terms of the offense. And they kept going from there. And Vladdy's three homer game at the end of the month. Um, and April 27th was a big moment. And I think it was, at least for Blue Jay fans, he has that incredible month, but this is the moment where he first arrived. He hasn't really, at this point in the season, arrived on the national stage or the international stage in terms of baseball. But I think at this moment, he arrives for Blue Jay fans. We can say, okay, he's for real. Um, and there's just so many records from this game that are pretty amazing. Um, the youngest player in MLB history with three home runs and seven or more RBI in a game, the seventh youngest player ever, with three homers in a game, the youngest ever with three homers in a game, um, with one of which being a grand slam, one of four players since 2000 to hit three or more home runs in a game before his 23rd birthday, the youngest player in franchise history to have three career grand slams, and the eighth youngest hitter in history to have three career, career grand slams. So just, you know, a bullet list, a grocery list of, uh, of records for the Blue Jays and for Vladimir Guerrero Jr. there. And Watching that moment at that point in the season, it was pretty cool. Yeah, honestly, like with the season that Guerrero had, it just, you look back and you think, how are these possible? How are these numbers against Max Scherzer? Like he's one of the better pitchers in the league pitching for the Dodgers in the uh, NLCS right now. He is one of the premier pitchers and Guerrero was able to take him deep, ch charged him for four runs. I think he actually charged him for five if I'm not mistaken whatever that first home run was but to see things like that like the Blue Jays were down I think four to two at that moment they were able to come back with that home run they end up winning the game it was it was a weird moment because I mean I think and we'll get to this later in the season or later in the episode there were a few moments where you're thinking oh it'd be it would be nice to hit a home run here or it would be nice to do this and you know finally break through and then to see it actually happen, it just it's a culmination of very good players finally stepping into their into their zone. And for Vladimir Guerrero Jr., an all-star season, all-star MVP, probably the MVP of the season or of the American League. It's, it's debatable, and I'm not really sure how that's going to go. But he was one of the best players in the American League and really one of the best hitters probably as Dan Schulman put it, the best hitter on the planet this season, just the most consistent hitter. Yeah, there were some times where he kind of dropped off, but even his drop-offs were still major league average hitter type numbers. So amazing season for him, an amazing moment too, really, to take one of the one of the veteran premier hitters, the guy that's thrown multiple no-hitters, guy that almost had a perfect game. Like this, this is like if you're if you're looking to hit a big time home run against a big time pitcher. Yes, it was only in April, but these are one of those moments that you're talking about. And for Vladimir Guerrero Jr., great, uh, great overall season. But, you know, you look at games like that and if he was not the player that he was this year, or if he wasn't on the Blue Jays roster, they probably wouldn't even be 500. I'll be, I'll say it plain and simple. One of their best hitters, probably their best player overall. And to, be able to do things like that just on a regular basis. Like this guy hit almost 50 home runs. I think we're, we kind of forget just how good he was, but against Max Scherzer, great to see. You, obviously you hate to see good players and good respected veteran players get rocked, but when your team is the one doing it, it's okay. So I mean, like it just, it was a, it was a fantastic moment. And really it was the entire game too. It wasn't like he hit one home run and that was it. Like it just, it seemed as if everything that hit his hit his bat just left the yard. So amazing thing to see. Again, you wish you could have seen something like this in the playoffs because I think it was entirely possible. But I'm just happy to see that things like this happened. And I'm also, last thing I'll say is he is still a Blue Jay for many seasons to come. So this is not as if, oh, they missed out on 
a good season by Guerrero. And now next season, they're scrambling to find a first baseman. No, he is somebody that's staying for a long time and you love to see it. And it's, it's, I don't know. I've, it's just, it's one of those things you love to see. And he's a guy that'll be here for a while and probably be putting up these numbers for quite a while too. Yeah. I mean, Vladimir Guerrero Jr. Uh, for that home run hatch against the Washington Nationals. And it's something that I kind of actually forgot about later on in the year, just because of how long ago it felt like it felt like it was ages ago. And obviously too, that was back in the Dunedin days when they were playing out of TD ballpark to start off the year. So a lot of things have changed since then. And a lot of things did change. It just felt like it was so long ago. And I'm sure this is not the only time we are going to see a Vladimir Guerrero Jr. Hat trick, but yeah, he takes Max Scherzer deep twice. Uh, I think it was Kyle Finnegan. He took deep for the third time. Uh, I know, but I do know two of them was off of Scherzer. So that was obviously impressive to begin with because of, you know, the April and that was kind of still early on before we actually knew how good Vladimir Guerrero Jr. was going to be this year. And obviously we know how we pretty much ended off and uh, in 161 games, but it just that home run or those three home run games, I think that was kind of the first, not even, it was just one, one of the first, I'll say one of the first signs that we got is this Vladimir Guerrero Jr., is going to be the one that we were anticipating all this time. And I think that was the first signal that we got, or at least one of the first signals we got. So that is why it was pretty much exciting for that start of it. But as much as, you know, it's kind of hard to remember that this happened because of how long ago it felt like and how long a baseball season is. Uh, it's just crazy to believe that, uh, you know, after that home three run, run home or three home run game, it just continued to pile on and pile on and him lighting it up home runs everywhere, no matter what ballpark, the Jays were playing at the RBIs, his OPS being above a thousand all year, which is something that was truly special to see. And you do hope that he eventually does get that MVP award that he might get robbed of this year. Um, call me crazy or not, but there is a few people that think he does deserve some consideration, regardless of whose side you're on for that one. You do hope eventually he does get that MVP award maybe in the future. So uh, that's why I, some, or it's just crazy to believe that the numbers he put up this year um, and you hope that he continues to do that for the rest of his career, or at least for the, foreseeable future because that was truly special and um, he was definitely one of the reasons why the Jays finished where they were just short of a playoff spot but he was definitely the reason why they were in that race to begin with for sure it's also crazy that we're talking about this as the number five moment or, or number six moment from a season like he had such an amazing season and the Blue Jays had such an action-packed season that we're talking about this moment as being the sixth best this year that there's five moments better than this moment this season, including one from Vladimir Guerrero Jr. I don't want to spoil it too much, but Vladdy has another moment on that list ahead of this Homer game, this three Homer game. So it's just incredible. The incredible season he had, the incredible numbers he put up start to finish. And yes, he had those cold streaks. Yes. He wasn't totally who he was in April when he was in September and in August, having that little slow streak when the Blue Jays returned to Toronto and kind of carrying over into mid-September. But um, just incredible numbers from him. And of course, we know finishing tied for the home run crown in Major League Baseball ultimately doesn't finish atop, um, you know, the triple crown categories average in RBI, but he's close to the lead in all of them. So an incredible season from him for sure. Um, okay, moving on to moment number five. on the mound and the bearded Sam Dyson. Now he comes set. Kicks the 1-1 one, one pitch. Fly ball deep left field. Yes, sir. There she goes. 